and I'm uh, really glad to have uh, someone here to talk about JRuby. You know, JRuby is a big deal. You should all be paying attention to it. And so I'm really happy to have uh, Charlie Nutter here. He's at Red Hat, and he's uh, one of the, the, like the principal brain behind JRuby. And he works on JVM languages at Red Hat, doing a lot of cool stuff with them. And he's going to tell you um, about uh, making Ruby high performance. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Thank you. All right, I have to ask the usual intro questions. How many people have ever used JRuby for something? Wow. How many people are using it for something in production right now? OK, fewer, but we're getting there. A lot more people have tried it out. That's good. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about JRuby and how we're trying to optimize Ruby, but in general, what the challenge is and some of the ways that we've come up with to try and find ways to make Ruby fast and actually make Ruby a higher performance language than it is. Uh, so basic contact info, uh, as mentioned, I am one of the JVM language guys at Red Hat, specifically in the JBoss Polyglot group that's working on Polyglot web server applications, web server services, stuff like that uh, within JBoss. Uh, mostly doing JRuby right now, but hopefully after JRuby 1.7 is done in the next month or so, uh, I'll probably be looking at trying to take what we've learned to some of the other JVM languages as well. So what does performance mean? Uh, there's usually two metrics that people use when they talk about Ruby, if they talk about Ruby as far as performance goes. Uh, you know, the whole man hours being more expensive than CPU hours. All right, so Ruby's not that fast, but we can write stuff in it really quickly. We can maintain it easily. Uh, everybody's really happy when they're using it. And so that's, that's one measure of the performance of a language. And by that measure, Ruby probably already is a high performance language if what you're trying to do is just get applications written and maintain them well. Uh, but I'm going to be talking more about the other definition of performance, the one that usually translates to, uh, to the bottom line of older applications, applications that continue to grow, the straight line performance of running code and how we can make that better within Ruby. So what is high performance then? Well, high performance is faster than something, faster than other Ruby implementations. That's been one of my concerns, trying to make sure we're doing it as well as possible. Uh, other language runtimes. Uh, people will say Ruby isn't as fast as Java or Ruby isn't as fast as .NET or whatever else. And so it can't be considered high performance if it's not as fast as some of those other, oper those other systems. Uh, unmanaged languages like C, like raw C performance. We want Ruby to be as fast or faster than C someday, right? I mean, that's a goal, but is it a reasonable goal? Is it a goal that we actually need to reach? Uh, but really, high performance is kind of faster than you need it to be for whatever job you're trying to get done. Now, if you're just running a website and you're running a Rails application, high performance may not be a huge, huge goal to achieve. And that may not be that difficult to just be able to serve up a bunch of requests, especially if you've got other back-end services that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you. But we want to be able to use Ruby more in the system. We want to be able to use it everywhere and not have to fall back on other options all the time. Um, so if what does fast enough mean? That's one thing that people have said about Ruby for years. Apparently, Ruby 187 was fast enough. But now that Ruby 193 has come out and it's considerably better, much, much better performance than 187, uh, Ruby 193 is now fast enough, and Ruby 187 is slow. So was everybody lying then, or were they just didn't need the performance that they get from 193? Maybe they found other ways to work around it. So 193 is now fast enough, but again, there's going to become a point for any application that continues to grow where fast enough just isn't fast enough, and then you have to have some other fallback. And you hit this performance wall with your application that you can't make your application do what it needs to do in the amount of time that you have available. So you're trying to get the certain amount of work done with the available CPU resources, monetary resources, and whatever you have. Uh, so at this point, what do you do? You can move to a different runtime. If you're on 187, you can move up to 193 and probably get a free performance boost for most stuff. Uh, maybe get a performance hit if you're doing something with encoding sometimes. Uh, or move to a different language. Maybe you fall back on doing C extensions, which is one problem that uh, seems to plague Ruby a lot. People give up on Ruby itself and move to something else before they've really given Ruby its chance to do what it wants, needs to do. And my claim here is that if you're not writing performance sensitive code in Ruby, you're probably giving up too easily. There are other options. There are other ways that we can make Ruby fast, and JRuby is one of them. So we're going to see how we're actually working on that. 
And probably the biggest dodge, like I said, is people falling back on native extensions to get performance. Now, native extensions for integrating libraries, existing libraries that do something you need, is not a bad thing, not a universally bad idea. Um, there's a lot of libraries out there that just don't exist in any Ruby form or on the JVM as a Java, JVM bytecode form. So calling out the native libraries is not bad. What's bad is the way that they're implemented in CRuby right now. The C API for C extensions is very invasive. It has direct access to pointers. People access the internals of objects directly all the time. And so unless you're Ruby, unless you're MRI, you are very limited in being able to support this API. And even worse, MRI is limited in what they can provide as a runtime. So one of the things that we want out of Ruby as far as performance and making a scalable, high performance platform, we want to run code faster, that's one thing, which involves maybe getting a JIT in there, getting some native code execution going on. Uh, better GC, even with Ruby 193, people see GC times, uh, GC pauses of multiple seconds in production applications. Overall GC consumption of CPU is in the 10 to 20% range, and that's all just wasted cycles. So we need a better GC. We want to be able to run things in parallel. Rather than having to spin up multiple processes, we'd like to be able to just have a threaded worker system or an actor system within a given process that can use all those cores. Rather than trying to coordinate across processes, serialize data back and forth, and use all the cycles that we use for that then too. Um, and then big data. This kind of falls into GC, but as the size of a Ruby application grows on MRI, that GC performance hit gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It continually increases the percentage of time that it has to scan all of this data, even if only a small part of it actually gets collected. So these are the things that we want out of a Ruby runtime. But unfortunately, these are the th exact things that we can't have with the way C extensions are implemented today. They need pointer access, so you can't move them around in memory. You can't move old data into a, a GC-free zone or a more permanent zone to allow it to be not considered for garbage collection. Uh, JIT-wise, it's much more complicated to build a JIT that works with the way C extensions are written right now. Parallel execution is almost impossible because we can't make any guarantees about that native code, and none of those guarantees or promises have been made from the beginning. So there is no standard memory model for how native extensions should par parallelize. There's no guideline for how to write code, and so nobody's doing it. Nobody's writing C extensions with parallelism in mind. And then big data, of course, all the same problems with GC and execution we've got, trying to deal with all that data in memory if you're writing it all in native code and dealing with native access, you're passing a lot of information back and forth across that Ruby boundary. So this is a different approach. Rather than falling back to C and using C extensions, maybe we can try and actually make Ruby itself be a heck of a lot faster. We can improve Ruby and improve the runtime. So there's two options, really. You can build your own runtime which is how Ruby 193 went with YAR, the new bytecode-based VM, which has worked very well for them. Uh, Rubinius is another implementation that they've built their own runtime from the ground up. They have their own bytecode VM, and then they have a JIT internally as well they're working on. Um, MacRuby, I list in both of these, because MacRuby has written their own compiler on top of LLVM, but the whole object system is basically the Objective-C runtime. So then using an existing runtime, we've got JRuby, where we run on the JVM. Uh, Maglev, which uses the uh, Gemstone Smalltalk runtime to implement Ruby. Uh, Iron Ruby on top of .NET, of course. And, and there's lots and lots of other Ruby implementations that have chosen one of these two approaches. So the question you'd ask when you get to this point is, do you want to build something completely new, or do you want to take something off the shelf, run on an existing runtime, and just build on top of it? Uh, the truth about making a VM is that it is pretty easy to make a simple VM. There's lots of examples of this. The early versions of Rubinius were very trivial, simple bytecode VMs. Uh, y, before he left the community, did his little Potion VM, which was another little VM implementation. Uh, Mark andre Corner did uh, TinyRB, which is a very small, under 64K of code or something, or under, under 16K, some really small number, and it was a, basically a VM for Ruby. But making it competitive, with existing VMs, making it into something that can be compared against C or compared against native languages, as far as performance goes, is incredibly hard, incredibly hard to do. And so with JRuby, we obviously took the approach that we're going to take something off the shelf that works already, that we know is high performance, and we're going to use that. So we look at the JVM, and there's like 15 years of engineering in specifically OpenJDK, Hotspot. 
Uh, it's free, open source, it's GPL, and you can fork it and do whatever you want with it. Uh, and it is pretty much the fastest managed runtime, managed VM available. Uh, definitely faster than, than, than C-sharp.net. C uh, when you look at measurements and comparisons that people do between the JVM or Java applications, or Java algorithms at least, they're comparing with C and C++. It's up to that level. Sometimes it wins, sometimes it doesn't. But it is by far the fastest managed runtime available. So we just pick the best runtime that we can, and we decide to build JRuby on top of that. Uh, also has the best GCs available. If you look back for the past 10 years at research on garbage collection, how to make it fast, how to make it use fewer resources, pretty much all of them end up with a JVM implementation, at least as the proof of concept. And uh, for example, OpenJDK, the hotspot VM has, I think, six different options for garbage collection that use parallelism, that run concurrently, that are reduced pause times, guaranteed certain pause lengths, so and so. But in general, if you're using a JVM, you're going to have the best garbage collection that's available for your system. So we've already got that for free. Uh, all the major JVMs are fully parallel threaded. So they've worked out all the difficulties of making that runtime run those threads in parallel for us. We just build on top of it. Uh, and then broad platform support. All the major operating systems, all the server operating systems have JVMs for them, even the most obscure ones, HP UX, and we've got guys that run JRuby on AS400 for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> And a lot of you don't even know what AS400 is, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a better choice than a lot of other options at AS400, I'll tell you that. All right, so, now, the, this, this rumor is slowly starting to die out, finally. Java was slow at one point, uh, before it got a JIT, before they did a lot of this work on garbage collection. But Java is really fast. I mean, literally C fast, if you write code that would kind of match up one-to-one -one as far as the work that's being done. The reason that people have this this issue or this belief or the, the, the myth of Java being slow is because the way a lot of Java libraries force you to write applications makes those applications slow. Java is a terrible application development language. It requires you to do so much of this abstraction just to save yourself in the end that you build these gigantic abstraction frameworks. You have too many levels, too many re redirects and, in, and, and, de and dereferences of objects all over the place, and so applications end up being terribly slow. But algorithms, like simple sorting algorithms, mathematical algorithms, literally can compile down into exactly the same assembly code that you'd get out of C or C++. So we can have C performance running on top of the JVM if we know how to do it. And the bottom line of this is that the way you write code is way more important than whatever language you use. Now, the runtime is going to play into it sometimes. If the runtime has its own built-in performance hits, that's always an issue. But the way you write code on the JVM or anywhere else is much more important than what you write it in. OK, so that brings us to JRuby. So it's a Java and bits and pieces more and more in Ruby, implementation of Ruby on top of the JVM. So we're bringing Ruby to the JVM. We're also bringing the JVM to Ruby. And ideally, trying to be as close to one-to-one -one compatible with regular Ruby as possible. Um, JRuby 1.6 was released with pretty good Ruby 1.92 support. Uh, JRuby 1.7 will have much more solid 1.93 support. We also still do have very solid 1.87 support. So if you've got stuff that still depends on 1.87, throw it away. Um, <laughs> so it's exactly the same memory and threading model as the JVM. We don't change anything. We get everything else for free. Uh, and we do eventually JIT compile Ruby code into JVM bytecode, which it can then take and turn into native code. And this is what I do. I sit and watch this process all day, make sure that it's optimizing the right way, and then try to figure out ways to make it better. And so that's really all there is to it, right? That's what JRuby is, and here we are. We've got high-performance Ruby. But this is a much longer road, unfortunately. Ruby is a challenge to optimize. Nobody has found all of the magic solutions to make Ruby fast in all cases. We've done a lot of work over the past five to six years in JRuby to make it run Ruby code as fast as possible, but there's still things that we haven't figured out. Still things about Ruby that defy optimization, at least with what we know today. Um, so, you know, there's, there's getting the interpreter to run faster, ideally getting it to JVM bytecode as fast as possible and making sure that bytecode is optimized well, making sure that the JVM then takes that bytecode and optimizes it even better down into native code. Um, and that's, that's actually a small part of working on JRuby, making sure that all of the string methods and array methods and hash methods are as fast as possible and don't have obvious, egregious performance bugs in them, and then just kind of repeating this process over years. Um, here's the 
let's see, commit graph uh, off of GitHub for JRuby, uh, going all the way back to 2001 when the first couple commits came in from the original contributors. And you see there's a little bur burst of activity at the beginning. They got some basic things working and then it was probably incredibly slow at that point. Probably weren't too excited about continuing on with it. And it sat dormant for a while. And then my co-conspirator, Tom Annabo, got involved in 2003, 2004, and he started working on it. Things started to pick up. 2005 or so, I got involved, started rewriting the interpreter, trying new ways of doing stuff. Uh, and then in late 2006, where things really started to pick up, that's when Tom and I started to work on JRuby full time. We went to Sun Microsystems. They were very interested in JVM languages at the time. We went there and started to work on f things full time, and then it really started to pick up. In 2008, we kind of had a reasonably good interpreter. I started working on the compiler to turn Ruby code into JVM bytecode. Uh, continuing on all the way up to today, I mean, the, the activity level has stayed pretty much constant or rising over that time. And this is all just continuing to find better ways to run Ruby code, get Ruby 193 and other features working well, and bring the best Ruby possible. But this is a long process. I mean, literally six years of the big part of this work, and there was work done before that, too. So our goal usually is to try and align Ruby execution with what the JVM wants to see. So we want to have Ruby arguments just be JVM arguments. We don't want to have them a separate structure that we have to pass them around in. Uh, making Ruby local variables just be JVM local variables so that when it optimizes them down to registers, we actually get that for free. Uh, avoiding all this extra framing and, and method information that's off stack on some other, on some other data structure uh, and avoiding all of the between call nonsense, looking up the method repeatedly. We obviously don't want to go and do a hash hit every single time. And God forbid we do a hash hit on an entire hierarchy of classes every single time. We want to eliminate that and avoid all that extra overhead. Uh, but the, the bottom line, the golden, golden rule of optimization is eliminating unnecessary work as much as possible. And what unnecessary work do we have in Ruby? Well, there's a lot that we could be wasting our time on. So every module or class is basically a map or a set of maps. Uh, there's a map from the name of a method to the body of it, the code that goes along with it, a map from the name of a constant to whatever value it has, uh, class variables, very similar structure to, to how methods work in the hierarchy. Instance variables traditionally have been implemented as just a map on every object. Uh, newer Ruby implementations like 1.9 and JRuby have ways to avoid doing a hash hit every single time you go into that object. All this stuff is basically wasted cycles if we can't find a good way to cache it, a good way to optimize it, so we're not constantly hitting a table somewhere to do a lookup. So for method lookup, what do we do to optimize this? So within each class or module, there is the map that lists all of the methods um, at every level in the hierarchy. Uh, methods are retrieved from that class or the ancestors by just walking up the hierarchy, finding that name, and then we're done. We don't go any further because that obscures any methods above it. Um, we've got in JRuby a serial number at that point that says, I am at this version of the foo class and I'm caching this method. If, this, if any of these classes changes or any of the classes above me, any ancestors change, throw this away, we need to do another lookup. And we do that by having a weak list of all the children. So we have our hard link going up the hierarchy and a weak link going down. So any method anywhere in the system changes, we can tell all the classes below it that they need to flush out their caches. Something's changed, you need to look up the methods again. So graphically showing how this actually works. So you look up a method, we're doing a 2S on our little Rubyist class here. We'll, all, we'll walk all the way up to thing, which is where we have it actually implemented. And we've got that method in hand now. Now this is what we want to avoid doing every single time. We don't want to have to walk this hierarchy every single time we do this call. So that 2S method then gets pulled down to the bottom and cached within the Rubyist class. So at the Rubyist level, we know that that method is there. We only got one hit at least to get that method. And then if anything changes up at the top, so we add a new 2S, we re-implement it. We need to go down that hierarchy, flush everything out, and then our 2S goes away, and we've got to do another lookup the next time. What about constant lookup? So constant lookups are a little bit more complicated as far as how you find them. They can be found within a class hierarchy or based on like lexical scoping, which modules surround this piece of code. So because of that, we only have one global switch 
that says whether constants have been updated somewhere. It's too difficult for us to have a weak structure that points back to every place a constant might be accessed. Um, so we cache that at the, at the point where you use it with a serial number that says this is what the versions of all constants in the system were at. And whenever they change, we have to flush that out. Instance variables, the JRuby way, each class actually just holds a table of offsets into the object. Rather than going to the class and saying, give me the value of foo, we go to the, rather than the object and asking for the value of foo out of some hash table, we go to the class, say where in the object, what offset into the object is the foo variable stored at, and then we can save that value for next time. As long as we're still accessing the same class, we can go straight in, we don't have to do a hash hit. And that saves us a lot of overhead that is typically there in most Ruby implementations. And so the bottom line of optimizing Ruby is making these things fast, and along with closures, which we're still kind of trying to improve the performance of. Making calls as fast as possible, making constants free, ideally, so that once you've looked it up, you don't pay any more cost ever again. Making these instance variables as cheap as possible, like just indexing into memory somewhere. And that's where a lot of invoke dynamic stuff comes in. So what is invoke dynamic? So is it about invocation? Well, it's an obvious thing, but it's not the only thing. We can use it for doing fast invocation, but there are many other uses, as you'll see here. And, and we're using it for all sorts of aspects of Ruby that have nothing to do with method calls. What about dynamic? Well, dynamic typing is a common reason for using invoke dynamic, but things like instance variables, which is just a growing list, or constants, which are essentially lazily defined, not static constant values in the system, they're not really dynamic languages, not, they're dynamic dispatch, dynamic typing related. They're just concepts that we need to be able to do at runtime rather than being able to do all at compile time. So a little JVM 101. How many people have used the JVM, run job applications, anything like that? Okay, so most folks have touched the JVM at some point. So there are 200 opcodes currently in the JVM. Um, 10 or 16 are what I would call data endpoints. And that's things like invocation, different types of method calls for virtual methods, interface methods, static methods, and then super or constructor calls. Uh, field access, getting data out of an object or getting data out of some static field somewhere. And then getting data in and out of arrays. And so pretty much all Java code just revolves around these data endpoints. Everything else is stack juggling and basic math and uh, flow control kind of stuff. But when, at the end of the day, if you're going to accomplish anything, you're going to deal with one of these methods or one, one of these operations to put data somewhere, get data somewhere, or make a method call of some kind. So the problem here is that this is our little bubble of what we can do on the JVM with the available operations. We've got our basic data endpoints. We've got all these other bits and pieces that help wire code together. And unfortunately, if you ever stray outside of this line, a stray outside of what the JVM can do, you're stuck. And you have to basically use this as the only functions, the only features of the runtime to implement a language or implement a library. You're kind of just stuck inside there and you have to back off. And you know, it's, it's frustrating to me sometimes. You can look at a runtime like Parrot which was, or no, uh, yeah, Parrot, which had like 10,000 operations or something. They just kept adding new ones. The Parrot was uh, the original plan for the Perl 6 VM, but they also wanted it to be the ultimate dynamic language VM. And it had thousands and thousands of operations. So why doesn't the JVM just have millions of opcodes that can do all these other things we want to do, like dynamic dispatch, like lazy constants and all that? Well. See, the thing is, if with invoke dynamic, we actually can get around a lot of this. We generate code with invoke, with invoke dynamic. The JVM actually then just asks us what to do at that point. So at runtime, it kind of bootstraps our logic rather than going to one of the standard JVM operations. Um, a diagram kind of helps to show how this actually works. All right, so we have our little switchboard, which is essentially the JVM and all of our code in it. So we've got our invoke dynamic up at the top. We're making a call, say. We're, we're calling a 2S method in Ruby. Um, and we insert our invoke dynamic into the bytecode at that point. That goes to what's called a bootstrap method in invoke dynamic terms, a piece of code that we've defined in JRuby that says how to find the 2S method, how to look it up and, and, and make the call. 
Our bootstrap method then returns a handle to that method. We've got the 2S code. We give it back to the JVM and say, OK, this is what you're actually looking for at this point. The JVM then can go right to that target piece of code, make the call, and the magic of it is that after we've made this loop once, all of that stuff can just go away. It all disappears. We actually have a direct binding at the JVM level from our, tar our call to the target method. And then it can optimize it exactly the same way as any other JVM language, Java, Scala, whatever else, for Ruby. All right, a little bit more detailed example here. So here we have a, a, an example of dynamic invocation. How are we doing it on the JVM with Invoke Dynamic? All right, we've got our call to foo, and that basically goes to the JVM level and says, I need to do a foo call on this object. The JVM then uses our logic, the JRuby code, to go into the method table, find the foo method, and grab it, and hold it in hand. We'll make that call, actually invoke the code, and then it puts it back all the way in the call site where we had our foo call and saves it for us so that we don't have to do this again. Now, constants work largely the same way. We've got our VM operations and we've got our call site, which is just accessing a constant. So we go to the JVM, we say, I'm looking up this constant, figure out how to find it. The JVM calls back to JRuby and says, how do we do this? What's your logic for looking up this particular named constant? We get that value and we say, okay, here it is. Here's, how you, here's the value that you need. Here's some information on whether you need to invalidate it, whether it's ever going to be stale in the future. And that value then goes all the way back, gets inserted into basically the native code at that point, and never accessed again until maybe if you're, if you're doing something silly and defining a lot of constants at runtime, it might come back. But it essentially is free at that point. I actually had a benchmark where I would access the same constant 100 times in a tight loop. And before Invoke Dynamic, before we could tell the JVM exactly how to bind that constant in and make it permanent, that was a great benchmark. It showed me how much cost there was involved in looking up a constant. Once Invoke Dynamic stuff got in place, it became a completely worthless benchmark because the JVM would see, okay, we've bound this exact same static value into the code 100 times. I'm just going to throw 99 of those away and only use the last one because the other values aren't ever even touched. It actually can optimize it down to a real constant access, which I don't think any other, J any other uh, Ruby VMs can do at this point. So instance variables. Instance variables are kind of interesting. So we've got our VM operations. We've got the site where we actually access the instance variable. We go to the JVM. The JVM asks us in our offset table, where is, this, where is the bar value or the bar entry in this object? And here we've got our little table. Uh, foo is at 0, bar is at 1. We can take that back all the way to the call site. And as long as we're always accessing the same object, we just have to say, give me the first variable in that table, in the table for this object every time. And it's just a one or two hop dereference in memory, rather than doing the full hash hit that we would do in, for example, Ruby 187. We access the object. All of this stuff goes away. And it's basically free from then on, or, or you know, two memory dereferences for the most, at the most part. So Invoke Dynamic basically lets JRuby teach the JVM how Ruby works so that it can optimize it like anything else, any other language on the JVM. Allows us to work around those 16 or so operations that we had to, were limited to before. We can do everything those can do and a whole lot more. All right, so how do we know that we've succeeded in optimizing Ruby? How do we know that we've, we're getting closer to the goal of high-performance Ruby? Well, obviously, we can do benchmarking, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. We can actually monitor what the JVM is doing and see if the op code is optimizing the right way. And then we also count a lot on user reports, people trying things out, letting us know if it's slow or fast or if it improves their case or not. So first of all, benchmarking. Benchmarking is really hard. It's especially hard on an optimizing system like the JVM or any of the op other optimizing runtimes because performance changes over time. Do you take the first 10 results? Do you take the last 10 of 1,000 results? You never know exactly which ones are important. Uh, as I mentioned, with that benchmark of accessing the same constant multiple times, if you get really good at optimizing code, your benchmark is totally useless, right? So it may optimize completely away, and you end up with a big zero for the performance number for that, which is interesting, but it doesn't actually tell you about a real application and whether it's going to optimize the way you want it to. Uh, so really, the, the problem here is that small systems 
like you would have in a benchmark, are completely different from large systems. Different in memory, different code patterns that they execute. Uh, the shape of the system is just completely different. And so benchmarks are kind of, they can obscure what the actual performance is or lack thereof. All right, so let's look at an example of perhaps bad benchmarking in action. Um, we're going to benchmark how much it costs to call basically an empty method. And the method just returns itself. There's absolutely no work of any kind. And we're going to do this 10 million times and see how fast it runs. And this is a favorite of new Ruby language implementers. Let's see how fast we can call an empty method. If we do that really well, we've, we've, we've solved the Ruby problem. All right. So this, the, I mean, here's the numbers comparing Ruby 1.9.3, JRuby, and JRuby with Invoke Dynamic. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's so much faster, right? But what is actually happening here? Is this actually a useful benchmark at this point? Let's, let's go through some observations from this and see what we actually have. So first of all, one slow runtime really screws up the, uh, the scaling of the table. You can't really actually tell even what the JRuby performance is here because it's so much faster than Ruby 1.9. And I actually, this is kind of mean, but <laughs> I did apologize for this afterwards, though. But I mean, that's the thing. When, when, when you're doing these comparisons with another runtime, sometimes you have to do a, a different way of looking at it. Raw time doesn't mean as much as maybe ratios against some norm. And, and of course, we're benchmarking an empty piece of code here. <laughs> and like, how often do you have, does somebody publish a new server performance number for, for uh, Ruby servers, Unicorn or anything else, that's basically doing an empty request? Well, I mean, shouldn't that just be zero? I mean, shouldn't that be zero at all the run times? It doesn't actually mean anything. So, I mean, we can, we can call empty methods really fast, but how many people just have applications written entirely in empty methods? Not many. So, the other thing that you might notice from this is that Invoke Dynamic doesn't actually seem to do a whole lot for us here. It's, it's cutting it down, but we're already pretty fast. So, we kind of have to go back to JVM Optimization 101 here. Um, so, it's going to compile the code after about 10,000 calls most of the time. Um, if it doesn't reach 10,000 calls, generally it's not going to, to actually JIT compile it. Uh, it'll inline up to two different target methods at a given point, normally. Uh, with JRuby and with Invoke Dynamic stuff, we can, that's kind of configurable, but a f only a, f a handful of targets, because usually most calls will have a single method that they'll ever see. Uh, it's also optimistic. So it makes very aggressive decisions about how it optimizes stuff that may turn out to be wrong later. But this is a key reason why small code and benchmarking a small application, a contrived synthetic algorithm, can be very, very different from benchmarking a large application. Because it'll make those optimi optimistic decisions for this small piece of code, and it'll never be wrong. Whereas it might be in a larger system. There might be more methods, there might be more classes. And so, again, Small code is very different from large code. If you're going to test out performance, you want to be testing it on something substantial. Ideally, you want to be testing it on what you actually are going to run in your application in production. Don't take these benchmarks as it's going to be fast every time. So back to optimization, inlining. So the key optimization that the JVM will give you is inlining code from one method into another. Basically, it takes a call site like our 2S call takes the code that goes along with it and sticks them together in the same ball of code internally, figures out how to optimize that as well as possible as a single unit, and then generates that machine code, rather than generating this piece of code on the left that does the 2S call and branching way off into memory somewhere for the 2S on the other side. Uh, so you treat them as, as, as basically as though 2S lived in the original one, and we avoid that call overhead, we avoid the branch in memory, which throws out the CPUs a little bit. Uh, and we can optimize things like variables that are passed in that are never used. And then maybe the values that were calculated for those variables, those calculations don't even need to be used. Things along those lines that we can do more of if we have more visibility in the system, which is what inlining gets us. And I mentioned optimistic. And so say we have a system, and the only method that it calls, or the key method that it calls, is foo. And that's it. And that's what we're benchmarking and optimizing. Well, all, all dynamic calls in that small world basically are foo, so every dynamic call must be foo forever, and we'll just optimize it as if it's always foo. And that's kind of what happens in this case. We optimize it for the, the only case that the JVM error actually sees. So let's, let's try and skew this. We'll play with the JVM a little bit. So before the, the actual benchmark here, I've got a couple other methods, and we'll do a bunch of calls to these other dynamic methods basically in the same way. And then you actually start to see some of these effects of what 
large systems change versus small systems. So here we have bench one and bench two on the top. Uh, the, the top line is the second benchmark where we're throwing the JVM uh, uh, a wrench. Uh, and you can see that it, it skews the performance considerably. It goes from 0 0.37, 36 something up to about 0.53 as far as the performance goes. Now we're actually seeing what a real system would look like as far as optimization. We have to run these sorts of benchmarks. We have to make the benchmarks more complicated or make them match our actual code in runtime. Uh, at the bottom, you can also see even in the book dynamic version, it does degrade a little bit. We're doing a better job. We're giving the JVM a better view of what actually is happening in the full loop versus the other loop, but it still does degrade a bit. And this isn't just JRuby. This is kind of common to any optimizing runtime. Here we actually have Rubinius numbers. Um, the top two lines are Rubinius, and you can see how much that, fir that, that additional code skews the benchmark in Rubinius as well. Changes the way that it optimizes the actual benchmark. And that's more, that's probably closer to what a real system would actually look like. All right, so we kind of know what happened. We optimized that early loop and we optimized all those bar one and bar two calls. And then when we got to foo, we're like, okay, now there's this completely different dynamic call. We've already seen a couple, we've already seen two other dynamic calls. I'm giving up at this point. I'm just gonna make them all be raw calls in memory. I'm not gonna do the same optimizations anymore. So the assumptions change and the performance ends up looking different. So that's why benchmarking is not always enough. And I'll run benchmarks all the time, but I, at the end of the day, I kind of have to actually look and see what the JVM is doing as far as optimization. We can look at whether it's compiling code, first of all. We can look at how, whether it's inlining code together so we can get a better optimization picture. And then you actually do have to sit and read what code it actually generates at the end. And I've spent a lot of time looking at the assembly code that JVM spits out for Ruby code to figure out how to make it faster. So, this is kind of a difficult one to read, but all you really need to see here is the fact that we've got the foo method here, um, this file, a file method up at the top, and I got these in the reverse order there. So the file method at the top is basically the root of the script, and specifically this is the zeroth block within that script. Um, and this is the JVM's compilation logs, inlining logs, showing that along with all of the invoke dynamic crud that's in between, it inlines all the way into foo there, and can, treats it as one unit. So now this will optimize down and pretend that it was all one piece of code to begin with. Now everybody knows assembly, right? Um, so here we're actually decoding what code the JVM generates for the foo method. So it's basically a blank method that just returns itself. Um, there is our foo method. That's the mangled name we use to generate it on the JVM. And here's the actual meat of it. Here's the actual assembly code for it. Um, so we do some stack manipulation, stack pointer manipulation. Uh, the move RCX to RAX is basically moving the self that was passed into this call into the return register, AX. We do a little bit more stack cleaning. The test there is asking the JVM if anything needs to be done like GC or deoptimization or whatever else, and then we return. So this is the kind of stuff that I have to read to figure out whether the JVM is optimizing this right. If I saw something in here more than move RCX to RAX, something's wrong because all it should be doing is returning the self that just passed in. All right, so let's go with a, a, a little bit different version of this that again is starting to get closer to a real system. Now instead of having one loop at the top level of the, the script, we're going to have an inner loop within an invoker method that we'll call multiple times on the outside. So getting a few more layers, a little bit more complexity, but still basically the same amount of work. Trying to kind of represent a, a larger system that actually is doing multiple method calls at multiple levels. So we run this one, and, and the results are kind of surprising. So, up at the, so the blue line is the first bench, which was our kind of wrong bench with Invoke Dynamic. Uh, the second one was the one where we threw the, the JVM off a bit. And the third one is where we're splitting things up into separate methods, breaking it up a little bit more like a real system would, giving the inner, inner code a little bit more time to optimize, maybe calling it 10,000 times so that all the JVM optimizations will fire. And that's the best performance yet. So now the system has gone back the other direction again. And this is why it's so difficult to get reasonable benchmark results from synthetic algorithms like this. So these benchmarks are synthetic. Now I have some, I'm, I'm, the next few slides are gonna be more interesting, more real world benchmarks, but please don't run things like empty benchmarks. Please don't run FIB, which I'm definitely guilty of doing a lot. 
Um, figure out what it is in your system that needs to be faster and try that. All right, so the first one here is a pure Ruby red-black implementation. Um, just using regular Ruby instance variables and accesses and whatnot. Uh, builds up a 100,000 node tree of random numbers, um, deletes them all, builds it again, searches for particular elements, walks it in different ways, um, just kind of exercising a simple data structure written entirely in Ruby that maybe, if it wasn't fast enough, you might have to drop to C for it, right? This is the kind of stuff that we want to make fast. Um, these are the numbers on JRuby and 193. Uh, Ruby 1.9 runs this in about four, four and a half seconds or so. Uh, and you can see the red line there is JRuby before Invoke Dynamic, also on Java 7. Uh, but the, the, the really good numbers, the JRuby plus Invoke Dynamic numbers, down at the bottom end up being in like the 0.8 second range. Uh, considerably faster than, than any other runtime. I think Rubinius comes a close at maybe like point, or like a one second or so maybe 0.95, something like that. Um, but there's, and there's a lot more that we can do. There's all sorts of cases in this code that are not optimizing as well. But you're looking at you know, several times faster, three or four, maybe five times faster than Ruby 193 already. All right, so math is another big one that we try to optimize. Uh, so I've got two little fractal generators here. One is basically a Mandelbrot generator. Uh, it has some integer loops that do the iteration pr process, and then a lot of floating point math. Um, the other one is just one I thought was fun because it's, it's a Julia set generator that uses Ruby flip-flops. How many people have ever seen a Ruby flip-flop? It's actually a syntactic structure in Ruby, right? How many of you have ever used a flip-flop for anything? There's a couple. There's a couple here. If you're, if you're used to like sed or awk, that's kind of where they come from, but I'll, you'll, you'll see the code in a minute. I don't understand what it's actually doing. <laughs> but it generates beautiful fractals, so it's, it's really a fun benchmark to run. All right, so there's the output from the Mandelbrot generator. Nothing too exciting. Um, here is the, the flip-flop-based fractal generator. And I have no idea what this is doing down here. I think I was looking for a flip-flop benchmark at one point, and I found this, and I'm like, well, oh, that takes the cake right there. I have no idea what's going on. The basic idea with flip-flop is that the first time it's encountered, it's true. And the next time it's encountered, the first time it's encountered, it is true if the left side of the dot, dot, dot is true, and the next time it uses the right side of the dot, dot, dot. And so you can use it to like switch things on and off. Like if you're parsing a file, you come to a comment line, you switch into comment mode for a while, then you switch it off again when you get out of comment mode. Uh, there's probably better ways to do it, or at least more readable ways to do it. But yeah, I mean, I have no idea what this is. It, it's exciting. But it generates really cool stuff. And it, and it actually generates this iteratively. So it like builds out from one side and sort of crawls across the screen. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll run it and you can see it. Um, so, and then here's the numbers for the, for the first fractal benchmark, the Mandelbrot one. Now the thing you'll notice here is that the numbers for Invoke Dynamic are, are basically identical. That's because large, by and large, for math, we've spent a lot of time trying to optimize it in JRuby itself. And the logic isn't really that different with Invoke Dynamic in play. Um, same thing with the Julia set result. Much faster than uh, one nine, but you know, Invoke Dynamic is not doing a whole lot for us here. Really helps with object access, instance variables, constants, things like that. And for anything that has a lot of method calls that aren't math. So what about Rails? There's a lot of Rails people here, obviously. Well, Rails is kind of still a mixed bag at this point. Um, there's a lot of code in Rails, a lot of work to optimize it. And we're, it's, it's, a, it's a long tail. It, it, it depends more on optimizing core classes. Like now we have to make sure that all the encoding logic for Ruby 1.9 is as fast as possible. Um, there are some significant gains for some people that run with JRuby. Uh, depending on the size of the application, depending on some JVM settings, you can definitely see big improvements as far as the performance goes. Um, but this, it, there's work in, work in progress here. So what's next as far as high performance Ruby and JRuby? Well, we want to continue to expand where we optimize. Um, right now, if you do mismatched arity calls or rest arg calls, we don't optimize those very well, and obviously I missed something. Um, <laughs> and I read through these too, and I was like, yeah, I had slides, right, I got it. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so super calls we don't optimize right now. Uh, closures I mentioned, we still are working to optimize those, and there's work to be done. Um, and then what, once we've got all the basic calls working, well, then it's kind of up to you guys and how you write Ruby code, what you do with it. Uh, is define method something that we really should look at making optimized? 
maybe, it, that is used heavily within Rails and within a lot of other frameworks. Uh, method missing, do people do a lot of method missing call throughs that don't generate a, a method for the next time? So you're constantly hitting method missing? Well, we might be able to find a way to optimize that as well, make it forced in line, make it actually be almost as fast as doing a regular call. It will take work though. Um, respond to, we do a little bit of optimization for right now with certain types of caching, so that if you're calling the respond to with the same symbol every time and respond to hasn't been overridden, we can just give you a, a true value back immediately. Uh, proc tables, there's some applications that use tables of procs and dispatch that way. So these are all possible, but we need to know from you whether they're worth it to spend the time on optimizing them. All right, so wrapping up the future. So Jamie is going to continue to get faster. Uh, we've taken this few steps back in 1.7 now to try, not back from performance, but back from working on it uh, to get 1.9 support, get functionality out there, and we'll return to performance soon. Um, there's going to be a lot more improvements to invoke dynamic at the JVM level too. Uh, those guys are using dynamic languages like JRuby, JavaScript, as their use case, their test case for optimizing Invoke Dynamic right now. And I hear from those guys every week or so with new performance numbers or asking me for stuff that needs to be optimized. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it, if we can't compete with what the JVM's doing, we're, we're not done yet. And we're going to continue to try and work on Ruby as much as possible to try and get as fast as all the other JVM languages. And you know, the JVM and JRuby are still fully free and open source from top to bottom. So give it a try, uh, don't be afraid of it, and let us know what you find out, performance-wise, compatibility-wise, et cetera. So that's it, thank you. No. Okay, I apparently timed it exactly 45 minutes.